Namaste. In this week, we shall have a look at canopy attributes. Now, canopy as we know consists of the uppermost branches of the trees in a forest that form a more or less continuous layer of foliage. So, to represent it, suppose we consider the trees in a forest. Then these trees have this umbrella like structure of leaves. In most cases it forms a more or less continuous layer and this is known as the canopy. Now why is it important to know about these canopies? For one, they change the microclimate of the forest. So, if we looked at this image, we see a forest and downside we see a very lush growth of undergrowth including shrubs and herbs. Now, in the case of this canopy, because all these leaves are giving out water through the process of transpiration. Now, in the process of transpiration, water that is getting into the trees from its roots goes to the leaves and is then given out through evaporation. So, evaporation through the leaves is known as transpiration. Now, if all these leaves here, here and here are giving out water vapor, what would happen to the amount of water vapor at this location? Naturally, it will be a moist region. At the same time, if we consider the sun, over a piece of bare ground all its rays are able to reach directly, but at this location the rays of sun can only go to the canopy and very little amount of light will be able to reach through to this point. So, it will be moist because uh, your sun rays are not uh, leading to uh, this temperature rise and uh, leading to a loss of moisture. So, this region is moist it is so moist or we could call it wet it is also dark as compared to a bare ground at the same time it is also cooler because your sun's rays are not able to heat up this region so the climate of this point also known as the microclimate is very different from the climate over a bare piece of land that being said, the, the nutrients that will be here on this portion will also be different from the, the nutrients we will be having here. Why would that be so? Because let us consider a tree. So, this is the ground level, these are the roots and then this is the canopy. The roots are taking in water plus minerals from the soil, then that water in minerals it goes up the bowl and then it comes to the leaves. From the leaves the water gets lost in the process of transpiration plus the minerals that have gotten inside from with the water they are then distributed. So, uh, these leaves will use sunlight to produce food. Now, that food would consist of carbohydrates, sugars plus these minerals they would also be distributed back to all parts of the plant through its phloem tissues. So, you will have minerals everywhere plus the food that goes to all the locations. Now, what happens after some time? After some time, this tree will get older and when it gets older or maybe this leaf gets older or when, when a time comes when this uh, tree is shedding of the leaves, 
then these leaves will come down to the forest floor now because these leaves also had these minerals so we'll get these minerals down here to the forest floor after some time these leaves would be eaten away by insects or by bacteria or by fungi or by some other organisms and then these leaves so all the energy that was there in the leaves that has gone into the bodies of the organisms all the minerals that were there in the leaves have gone into the bodies of the organ of these organisms now what would happen to these leaves later on these would then be defecated out from the bodies of the organisms or if they are being acted upon by bacteria and fungi they would directly be decomposed so a process of decay decomposition would and a process of assimilation would happen now not only would these leaves die after a while but also these organisms that have fed upon the leaves so their bodies now have this energy they now have the these minerals and after a while they will also decompose so when all that happens you'll get this layer of soil that is very rich in humus so humus is the uh, is the uh, decayed portion of these leaves plus it will have lots of minerals so for instance if you looked at a layer of the soil in the forest floor if you looked at the soil profile so to speak so we are looking at a soil profile so what is a soil profile if you looked at different layers of the soil in then if there are any differences they would show up and that is known as a soil profile so it would consist of a top soil that is rich in nutrients that would be followed by a subsoil that is poor in nutrients that would be followed by a layer where you have rocks rocks and pebbles followed by this big bedrock now what your roots have done in this case is that once these roots have gone down so they have their root hairs and they have been taking the minerals from these rocks and pebbles and later on in the form of leaves they are throwing it down to the top soil so now the, the nutrients have gone from your rocks and pebbles layer to the top soil so in this case the uh, this top soil beneath uh, this canopy is very rich in nutrients but what happens in the case of a bare soil in a bare soil you do not have all these processes going on so there are no trees that are sucking up these nutrients from the bottom there are no leaves that are putting these nutrients back into the top soil layer so what happens in the case of a bare soil so in the case of the of a bare soil these two processes are not going on so what will happen is when you have rainfall then these nutrients will get leached down so with the water they go down into the subsoil or maybe to this rocks and pebbles layer back so that process of leaching makes the top soil poor in nutrients so it makes top soil poor in nutrients so now remember that all these processes are happening because of the presence of trees and because of the presence of canopies so canopies have a predominant effect or impact on the nutrient availability in the soil below now if you remove the canopy from a site it would result in 
the death and decay of roots. So, how do you remove a, a canopy? You could uh, just clear fell a forest. So, the removal of its top layer would result in the death and decay of the roots as well, because now the roots are not getting any nutrients. It would result in changes in ground vegetation. So, this is because when you have a land and when you have trees, then the microclimate of these sites is very different because this is wet, this is moist, this is uh, cooler and it is darker. So, the kinds of organisms and the kind of vegetation that grows in this place would be very different from a place that is just exposed to the sun. So, when this place is exposed to the sun, then what is the condition here? This would be dry, it would be very hot in the day to very cold in the nights. In the case of these forest areas, we are having an equable climate or an equable microclimate, but in this case, we have a, a very hot condition to a very cold condition, we have this transition plus this area has lots of light. So, the kinds of species that you will find here will be very different from the kinds of species that you find here and why would that be so? Because of a condition known as a norm of reaction. So, basically if you consider any species, so we are talking about the norm of reaction of a species. So, if we plotted number of individuals on the y axis and the conditions on the x axis. So, suppose uh, we take the, the condition of say temperature. So, we are plotting it from 0 degrees to 10 degrees and 20 degrees, 30 degrees and say 40 degrees. Now, for any organism the most preferred temperature would be fixed. So, for instance, in our case, we can generally live, uh, I mean, uh, we are most comfortable when our temperature is say around 25 degrees. But if you put somebody into a place that has a, a temperature of say minus 20 degrees, he would not be comfortable, he would require lots of uh, energy, he would require lots of woolen clothes. Now, remember that other organisms say, a monkey, he, a monkey does not have access to clothes, a monkey does not have access to air conditioners. Similarly, if you put somebody into a very hot place, say a place with 50 degrees temperature, then your monkey will not be able to survive there. So, in the case of your monkey or say in the case of humans, we are most comfortable here at this point, but that does not mean that we cannot thrive at 30 degrees. We can thrive at 30 degrees, but the number of individuals that would be thriving at some other temperatures would go on decreasing. So, this would be our norm of reaction for species 1. On the other hand, let us consider some other species say a polar bear. Now, a polar bear can very easily live in sub 0 conditions. So, say minus 10 degrees Celsius minus 20 degrees Celsius. Suppose his norm of reaction goes close to 0 degrees. So, what we will have in this condition is, we will have a situation like this. So, this is for another species, species 2. Now, similarly for all different species, we will have, we will be having different norms of reactions. So, this is for species 4, this is for species 3 and so on. Now, suppose you change the conditions. So, suppose earlier your temperature conditions were close to this. So, at this temperature you are seeing a lot number of individuals of species 3, some individuals of species 4, but now let us move this temperature towards the right. So, suppose let us take this temperature. 
So, at this temperature, so let us consider this as temperature 1, let us consider this as temperature 2 and maybe let us consider this as temperature 3. So, at temperature 1, what all species do we see? At temperature 1, we are seeing species 3 and we are seeing species 4. At temperature 2, so 3 is uh, found in large numbers here, 4 is found in smaller numbers. Now, at temperature 2, we are seeing species 1, we are seeing species 4. Here, species 1 is in the majority. Now, if we looked at temperature 3, so at this one, we only see species 4. So, as you can see, species 4 was there in all the three temperatures, but the other species that are found along with species 4. So, in the case of temperature 1, your species 4 did not dominate the scene, it was dominated by, by species 3. But when you shifted your temperature from temperature 1 to temperature 3, now your species 4 is dominating the scene. Similarly, when you remove the canopy at a place, you are not only changing the temperatures, you are also changing the amount of moisture that is there, the amount of light that is there. So, the composition of the species in the uh, bottom layer will change. So, not only will the, the plant species change there, but also the animal species that will change there. So, now coming back to the slide. So, we have seen that canopy removal results in changes in ground vegetation. It also results in a disruption of surface soil. Now, why would the surface soil be disrupted? Because now the surface soil will not be having enough moisture, it will be exposed to the sun rays. Now, when this ground is exposed to the sun rays, what happens is that its top portion dries up very fast and when that top portion dries up, it will also result in the death of the individual of the species that are found there in the top soil. So, when that layer dries up, it results in a disruption of the surface soil. Also, when you have removed this canopy, all the nutrients that are there in the top soil will further get leased down. It also results in changes in nitrogen cycling. So, this is one curve from a paper which shows us that the net soil nitrogen mineralization as a function of uh, lignin by nitrogen ratio of above ground litter from 9 common garden experiments with temperate forest species. So, basically not only does the, uh, the uh, this removal of canopy bring about these differences, but also if you change the species that were forming the canopies. So, for instance, if you go to a forest that is full of teak trees, the canopy there might have lots of, uh, of teak leaves, but its bottom soil, I mean uh, its bottom layers, they will, will be having a very different composition as compared to the this bottom region in a sal forest or maybe in a mixed forest. So, species diversity also uh, changes the amount of nutrients that are available there. This canopy is also very important uh, for the purposes of biodiversity. So, why is that important? So, this image of the flowers, it shows orchids. Orchids are epiphytes. So, now again coming back to the word roots, when we say epiphyte, epi means above and phyte is a plant. So, epi is found in things like epidermis. or say epiglottis. So, epidermis is the top layer of your skin, epiglottis is the structure that is formed above the glottis. Phyte is a plant. So, epiphyte is a species that, uh, that resides on top of a plant. So, how does that happen? So, let us consider this tree with some branches. And suppose this is the canopy, your epiphyte would take up a position somewhere here. So, an epiphyte is not a parasite, so basically it is not take, deriving its nutrients from the tree, but it gives out some roots on top of this tree. So, it is not disturbing this tree, it is just using it as a place to live and then it would give out its leaves and maybe some flowers. So, this is an epiphyte. A very good example is orchids. 
So orchids live on top of trees. So if you did not have these canopies, then you would not have this specific microclimate. So this microclimate is not connected to the soil, it is connected to the air and this microclimate is having lots of moistures, it is having an ambient amount of sunlight. So it is not completely exposed to sunlight, it is also not completely not exposed to sunlight. So it is not living in dark conditions, it is living in conditions where your uh, sunlight intensity is at a medium level. So which makes this a very favorable microclimate for the thriving of, of epiphytes. So, this is one portion of biodiversity that comes out because of your canopy cover. So, if we move back to the slides now. So, biodiversity for instance orchids and epiphytes, biodiversity including arthropods. So, arthropods including say insects. So, arthropoda is a class of species that have jointed legs. So, insects are the most common example. So, for instance, uh, your canopy can be a, a storehouse for honeybees. So, you will have these canopies that are having some say beehives. So, if we did not have this canopy, we would not be having a beehive here because that again is a very specific climate that it provides. It also provides house to some mammals. So, coming back to the slides. So, there are some mammals that live in the canopies, for example, the sloth. Now, sloth is an animal that lives in the canopies, it is a very slow moving organism which also results in the slothing ref referring to somebody not taking interest in activities. So, somebody who is a very lazy person is called a sloth. So, this animal, this beautiful living animal and you can see the nails that it has at this point. So, it has very sharp claws. And it is a very sedentary animal, it will just live on the uh, on top of the trees, it would just eat some fruits out there and so on. So, this is one portion of biodiversity which you, you will not see outside of canopies. Now, canopies are also a good storehouse for the retention of carbon. So, for instance, in this tree that we have seen before, you have a lot of biomass that is retained in your canopies. So, it is important to understand the structure of canopies. So, what are the, the parameters or what are the attributes of a canopy? We could have canopy diameter. So, that is the diameter of this canopy if you are looking from top. We also have a crown length. So, by using both of these, we can calculate the canopy volume and biomass or the amount of carbon that has been sequestered in a canopy, we can calculate that as well. So, these are some parameters or some attributes of the canopies. Also, when we have these canopies, we can have a look at the canopy closure. So, a canopy closure tells us the percentage of uh, the area that is occupied by the canopies. So, for instance, suppose we in a forest, we had a canopy like this. So, we are looking at the top view of a forest. And suppose we take a sample, suppose this is our sample area. Now, the area of your sample is suppose capital A. Now, the area of the sample that is occupied by the canopies is given by this area. Plus this area, plus this area, plus this area. So, let us call it small a1, a2, a3 and a4. So, the area covered by canopies that is small a is equal to a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus a4. Now, area of sample or the sampling area is capital A. So, your canopy density is given by small a by capital A into 100 percent. So, for instance, in a dense forest, you might have a, this canopy density of greater than 0 0.7 or 70 percent. Whereas, in a scrub forest, for instance, if you go to Rajasthan, you will find lots of sand dunes with very little uh, less amount of trees. 
So, the amount of uh, canopy density that you will have there might be less than 0 0.4 or less than 40 percent. So, in that case we will call it a scrub forest whereas, in the case of uh, say 70 percent or greater canopy density we will call it a very dense forest. Now, in a uh, canopy we can also look at canopy layers. So, what happens in the case of forest is that you not only have large trees. So, here are some large trees. Then you might also be having some species that are thriving here. which are not able to access your complete sunlight, but are able to access some part of it. So, this will form another layer, then you might also have some other species that are growing here, that are very deprived of sunlight, but then they are also thriving here. So, this layer would be one layer of trees, this would be another layer of trees this would be the third layer of trees. So, this thing is known as canopy layers. So, now coming back to the slide here we are seeing a number of canopy layers at different heights. Now, to study these canopy layers we could look at the structure of the forest. Now, structure of the forest can be very easily ascertained by using lidar. So, for example, here we are seeing a canopy profile. So, you have this as the plane of a scanning. So, in this plane if you plotted uh, these canopy covers. So, for instance this tree is making this canopy, then this uh, pointed tree is making this canopy and so on. Now, these are uh, joint canopies of both of these trees and then this again is a small canopy that is formed out of this small tree. So, now if we took a scan of this region we would be getting our lidar profile is this. So, that can be used to study the structure of a forest. Now, the structure of a forest can also help us understand how what is the health of the forest and as we saw before what is the age structure of a forest. So, for instance here we are seeing a healthy forest. In this healthy forest it is a young forest in which most of our uh, trees are having an appreciable diameter and the canopy is very close. So, this is one example of a very dense forest for instance. Here we are seeing another forest which is a, a sparse forest that is dominated by shrubs. So, here we are seeing very few trees and lot of this space has been occupied by shrubs. So, this could be called a scrub forest for instance. This forest on the other hand is a heavily defoliated forest. So, what is defoliation? D is the removal of foliation, foliation is the leaves. So, for instance, in the case of a deciduous tree, if you look at that tree in a wet season it would look like this, whereas in a dry season it would give out all its uh, leaves and you would just be able to see the branches. So, this is a foliated tree and this is a defoliated tree. Now, a tree might be defoliated because of a number of reasons. For instance, in the case of teak, we have some insects called defoliators and some other insects called skeletonizer. Now, what does a defoliator do? A defoliator just makes all the leaves drop down to the forest floor, whereas in the case of a skeletonizer what is it does is suppose consider this to be a leaf. So, a skeletonizer would start eating into the lamina and then later on it, this this removal of the lamina would be so much that you would only be able to see these veins of the leaf, but you will not be able to see any of the leaf blade or the lamina. 
so all the lamina is eaten away and whatever remains it looks very much like a skeleton so that is a skeletonizer so some insects such as these defoliators can le can result in the defoliation of a tree also uh, some climatic conditions might result in defoliation for instance in the case of a deciduous tree if it is exposed to a dry spill then it will uh, it will shed all its leaves as a way of conserving moisture so that can also lead to defoliation another thing that can result in defoliation is some chemicals so there are some chemicals called defoliators for instance those chemicals that were were uh, were very highly used during the vietnam war they were they went by the name of rainbow chemicals so they were used by the army on the forest so that all the leaves got shed and then people would be able to spot their enemies very easily so if we went back to the slide so this is now showing a heavily defoliated forest so in this case we are able to see all the boles but then there is no canopy on top so this is a heavily defoliated forest so when we are talking about the canopy structure and by using lidar we can see whether our uh, uh, forest is healthy whether our forest is of a young age or, or an old age what is the amount of foliation in the forest and so on so understanding of the structure of a canopy and its attributes is a very important part in understanding the forest itself so this is something that we'll look into greater detail in this week thank you for your attention jai hind